Well, I hope you enjoyed that game of egg Russian roulette as much as I did. Um, I enjoyed it most of the part, partly because of the fact that I was the moderator, not a participator, so I didn't get egg on my face. Thank you to all you guys who, who um, competed in that challenge. You guys are good sports, and we had a lot of fun at your expense. So thank you for doing that. And, uh, you know, we may not be able to gather together, but we can still have fun, and glad that we were able to do that. I want to wish everybody a happy Easter on this very historic day. I can't believe that, you know, if you'd told me two months ago, we'd be meeting online across America for Easter services. I would have said, no way, get out of here. You're, you're kidding me. No way that would happen. But here we are, and I'm so glad we have the opportunity and the technology to do that. And if you're part of uh, Tannisborn, I just want to tell you how much I miss you. I wish I could be with you in person. I love getting to spend time with all of you. If uh, you're tuning in for the first time, we just want to say welcome. We, we really feel honored that you chose to spend a little bit of time with us today on Easter. Thank you for doing that. And hope that uh, you enjoy your time with us today and hope you have a great day. So I, I'm feeling really grateful right now. You know, in spite of all the circumstances we're dealing with right now, I'm very grateful for the fact that I have my family. I've got a wife and two girls and we're home together. And uh, I, I, I don't want to paint a pretty picture of perfection because it's not that. There's plenty of moments for outbursts and where we, uh, you know, the tension we kind of get under each other's skin and all that. But at the same time, I love having my family together. In the last four weeks, has been fun kind of getting closer to each other, and I, we have great health in our family, and so I'm grateful for that. But I think the thing I want to point out that I'm grateful for the most right now is my wife, and she's been, in the last couple of weeks, has been in the back of the room, and I've asked her if she would come forward um, to be up on the cameras. Usually, she's on the back side of the camera, and I've asked her if she'd come forward on this side of the camera. She didn't know why I, I've asked her for that, but I just I wanted to see if she'd come up. So here she comes up here with me right now. Sandy, come on over here. Move on up here. I just uh, I wanted to show you the better half of me. This is my lovely wife. You're looking beautiful today. <laughs> but uh, I love having her with me on this side of the stage because usually she's behind the scenes. And I just want to uh, express my gratitude to her and also to let you guys know that a lot of what you see succeeding um, on, the, on this, this side of the screen, the side you're watching, is a result of what she does behind the scenes. And she's been uh, working tirelessly uh, all day long, every day, working on making sure that the communication and the marketing and all the technology, all that stuff behind the scenes is flowing and going smoothly. And a lot of what you get to experience is a result of her. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do. I, it really means a lot to me. You're awesome. And I wouldn't be able to do what I get to do without you. So I love you and thank you very much. Now get out of here. Oh, another one. Oh, you like that, huh? Oh, man. Well, she's wiping away the love there. But I, I, I love having her be a part of the team, and I, I'm a very fortunate man to have her um, being the other half of me. And so, you know, we are uh, in now in, in the beginning of Easter here, we are kicking off a brand new series today called Rise, Turning Adversity into Advantage. And so um, it seems like a, a timely message for us to be talking about this idea of adversity because of the season that we're in. And, and I'm actually, I've uh, been really excited about this series that'll be four weeks long. And I looked up adversity in the dictionary. Adversity equals adverse or unfavorable fortune or fate, a condition marked by misfortune, calamity, or distress. And I think it's safe to say that in one shape or form or another, every one of us right now is facing adversity. If, if you're not, then you may want to check your pulse, make sure you're still breathing and, and your heart's still beating because um, I think all of us are, are facing that in some way, shape, or form. In fact, I'm going to ask you wherever you're at, I don't, you know, if, even if you're in the grocery store with your, your earbuds in right now, listening kind of privately, raise your hand if you're feeling overwhelmed right now. Raise your hand if you feel stressed out. Uh, I got to put my hand up on these. Raise your hand if you're frustrated. Not all the time, but there's been a lot more frustration than, than uh, not lately. And then raise your hand if you feel set up to fail. I, if, I think, let me point out, if you're a parent and you have kids in school and you've been asked to work from home, which is something you've never done, and kind of school your kids and get them through all their homework and their meetings with their teachers and all that stuff, you, feel, you may feel set up to fail. Or if you're a teacher and you've been thrust from live classroom teaching into online teaching, you may feel set up to fail. A lot of us are set with circumstances right now that really seem impossible for us to overcome. But it seems timely right now for us to talk about turning adversity and advantage and the fact that we can rise above our circumstances. During this series, I hope that your perspective shifts, 
that it shifts into a positive way because I believe that a positive perspective in any situation upgrades that situation. Right now, we have much to overcome. I think you would agree with that. I think there's incredible opportunity when we're faced with adversity. What do I mean by that? I have some thoughts about adversity and how we can overcome and what it can do for us, what the opportunity can bring us. First, I think in the midst of adversity is where we find opportunity. I think a lot of times we think that that opportunity comes when everything is just right, all the all the circumstances and everything is just perfectly lined up in order. Nah, adversity, I think, is where opportunity is found the most. Think about this. You can't have a rainbow without a storm. Author and pastor Chuck Swindoll said, we are all faced with a series of opportunity, opportunities rather that are brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. We're faced with a series of opportunities that are brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. I can handle the opportunity part, but the impossible situations, that's where it gets tough. Here's another idea about adversity. Adversity will force you to do something you wouldn't do if the adversity didn't exist. I think of the movie Jurassic World. These two boys are being chased by dinosaurs in a jungle, and they get to the edge of a cliff, and there's a, a, a pool of water below, but they're scared to jump off of it. And there's the, you know, the thing that we're afraid to do. But then the dinosaur comes up behind them. It changes the status quo, so they jump off the ledge to not get eaten, and, of course, they land safely in the water. And I think adversity will move us from a situation where, we, where the, the risk seems too high to feeling like, well, with the, the risk of the adversity that we're faced, might as well just jump in. And where we make decisions and we move forward in adversity in, in areas we wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, by the way, I believe there's two types of people when faced with adversity. There's two questions that get asked. And maybe you're the type of person who asks, how long will it last? Or maybe you're the type of person who asks, what can I learn while I'm in it? That's the questions we can ask when we're faced with adversity. And the question I have for you is, which one are you? Are you the person who asks, how long will it last? Or are you the person who asks, what can I learn while I'm in the midst of the adversity? What can we do in bad experiences? Because I believe that those bad, what we do in those situations will truly define us. They define who we become. And by the way, everything in life, you think about this, everything in your life worthwhile is uphill, up and to the left. Uphill is not easy. We want to coast. We want to go downhill, or at least give us some level ground. Uphill is not fun, but anything worthwhile in life is uphill. I think of uh, women who have given birth to a baby. If you're a, a lady who's given birth to a baby, you've been pregnant, gone through that, and given, gone through the birthing process, that is tough. That's something I've, I've, I would not want to endure myself. But what does it yield? These beautiful children. Anything worthwhile is uphill. Adversity comes, by the way, in all shapes and sizes, but I don't believe that it's the size or form that adversity comes in, but rather what we do with the adversity that determines our success. In other words, it's not what happens to you, it's what, happened through, what happens through you that matters most. We go through life trying to avoid, avoid adversity, and I mean, I'm a person who likes to take risks, I like adventure, I like living on the edge, but most of life, I like to settle into my comfort zones and avoid problems, avoid difficulties, and avoid the adversity that, that I'm faced with. Seems to be natural. We just kind of naturally do that. We have this belief that, that simple is better. I don't know where we got this from, but somehow we got this idea that the simpler life is, the better it is. That, that, that you know, for a season, that can, can last for a little bit and it kind of feels good. But over long, the long haul, simple is not better. Simple leads to all sorts of problems in life. Success does not come from avoiding trouble. I read these words last week, and I think it's worth reading again by um, the author M. Scott Peck, who is a psychologist in his popular book, The Road Less Traveled. Listen to these words. Life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see, uh, see this truth, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Because once it is accepted... The fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Most do not fully see this truth that life is difficult. Instead, they moan more or less incessantly, noisily, or subtly about the enormity of their problems, their burdens, and their difficulties. As if life were generally easy. As if life should be easy. My friends, let me tell you this morning, life is not easy. That's not the point. The point of life isn't to make it as easy as it can be. It's not about avoiding the lemons that life throws at us. It's about learning how to make lemonade. How do we take the tough situations and make the best out of them? I think of the author J.K. Rowling. 
J.K. Rowling, if you are familiar with her, wrote the Harry Potter book series, became very famous for it, and to, to date is the, the, the biggest selling fictional writer in history of the world. J.K. Rowling wrote, quote, wrote these words before she, she made it, uh, before she became popular with the Harry Potter series, she wrote these words, I was as poor as is possible to be in modern Britain without being homeless. That is the humble beginnings that she came from. She, she wrote these words, rock bottom became the solid foundation for which I rebuilt my life. Think about that. Rock bottom may be the solid foundation for which we rebuild our lives, me and you. In the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about redefining failure, trading burnout for balance, turning obstacles into opportunities. And today, we're going to talk about how to beat defeat. So I, I, I would encourage you over the next four weeks, if you can, to tune in for these next four weeks as we talk through how we can reframe our mind so that we can turn adversity into advantage in our life. So if we're going to talk about this idea of how to beat defeat. I think it seems fitting since today is Easter and we know Easter is about the ultimate comeback in, in history. It's about the Easter story. It's about what Jesus did for us. And just really quickly, just, let, if, just kind of bring you up to speed. If you don't know the story, Jesus comes to earth born as a baby that we celebrate that on Christmas and then lives a, a perfect life has a ministry for several years on earth where he goes around healing people and sharing the hope and love of God with them. And then on this, this week that we're celebrating, this week, this, this fate that is waiting for him, he goes through this week of everyone thinking he's the best to all of a sudden everybody thinking that he's down with Jesus, we need to crucify him, we need to kill him. We need to get rid of him. Life would be better without him here around. And so on what we celebrated on Friday, Good Friday, Jesus goes to the cross as an innocent human being, he's sentenced in a, in a fixed trial. He's sentenced to death and dies this horrible, awful, brutal death on a cross so that we could have a relationship with him. But here's why I think this is a fitting story to talk about today. When we talk about how to beat defeat, I don't think that there is any better comeback story of beating defeat than beating death. <laughs> I don't know of anybody else who has done something that good. Maybe like you know, illusionists have like pretended to beat death. I, I don't think there's any other defeat you could beat that's greater than the, the defeat of death, conquering death. That seems like to me, that's something we could learn from. How, how did Jesus do that? Well, we might not be able to help with the supernatural side of things, but I think what Jesus did with his life, the purpose that he lived his life with, we can learn from how we can be, beat defeat in our own life. So here we go. With Jesus as our model, I'd like to unpack a threefold process to beat defeat. The first thing I want to share with you is this. To beat defeat, we need to know the way. We need to know the way. What do I mean by knowing the way? I believe that, that we need to determine in advance the choices that we will make when adversity strikes. We've got to determine that in advance because if you wait until adversity to make choices, it's too late. It's absolutely too late. The author John, one of Jesus' disciples in the New Testament, records the word of Jesus in this idea of determining ahead of time what he was about and what his purpose was. He records the words of Jesus, the, thief, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, Jesus knew what his purpose was. He knew what he was called to do. He knew what he was going through. He wasn't going to be detoured or distracted by the lures of the world and the things that, that were around him to distract him. He said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He goes on to say in the next verse, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. See, Jesus knew even then, this is, this is long before he gave his life up on the cross. He knew that he would have to sacrifice his life for those that were in his care, for those who he loved. He knew his purpose and he stuck with it. He made that decision in advance. Jesus knew that, it, that he would be faced with adversity, and, and I think that he was wise enough to know that if he waited until the adversity struck, that, that night that he was betrayed by, his, by one of his disciples, one of his closer inner circle disciples, that if he waited until that night where he was betrayed and handed over to the, the people that wanted to kill him, that he may not have made the right choice. I think he made that choice well in advance that he was going to stay the course. He knew the way, and he was going to, to, to make that decision in advance. I think of when it comes to this idea of, of making decisions in advance, there's a, a, a football coach. You may know him if you're in the sports world. His name's Tony Romo. Tony Romo was uh, made famous this idea of teaching his players 
the very basic rudimentary acts of what you do. If this happens, you go here. If this happens, you go there. Here's how you, you your stance, and here's what you do when the ball is hiked. And so he had these very basic rudimentary things. I remember my basketball coach teaching me the basics of basketball when I was in junior high school. And he taught me how to, how to shoot the ball, and I'm a left-handed, so it comes off the left hand. He said, you know, when you take your shot, you got to put your hand up and follow through, kind of spin the ball off your hand. And he talked about kind of bending your legs. And when you're dribbling the ball, that you bounce it on your fingertips, not the palm of your hand, a slap in the ball, you kind of push the ball down and up. So all these basics that, that kind of determine ahead of time what my choices are going to be when I'm in the game, in the heat of the moment. And so Tony Romo was so successful at this. His team became very successful because he taught them the basics where they had really, if you make a decision in advance, your, your choice isn't really a choice, it's a reflex. And that's what we need to do is we need to decide before the adversity strikes how we are going to respond in adversity so that our choice is actually just a reflex. I think of, for my life, I think of the, uh, the fact that we have this snooze button on our alarm clocks, which I think is like the worst invention ever because I was really good at using it. And I'm not a morning person by any means. I like staying up late. And many times I caught myself staying up too late and then not getting enough hours of sleep at night. And I'd set my alarm ahead of time to make sure I woke up on time for what I needed to get accomplished in the morning. But I always in the back of my mind knew I had a nine minute snooze if I needed it. And so for the longest time, I don't know, for years and years and years, my alarm would go off and my, my knee jerk reaction, my reflex was to hit the snooze button, not to turn it off and get up. Until I heard someone say, that's the worst thing in the world, don't do that. You, when you set your alarm, make sure you set it for a time that you know you will be getting up by. And then I set the alarm for like the latest possible time I could get up, and I knew that I had to get up at that point in time. It was interesting how, oh, how easy that decision became when my reflex was turn the alarm off and get up out of bed immediately. And so in our life, when we're faced with that adversity, and by the way, for me, as not a morning person, that's a lot of adversity, trying to get up in the morning when you don't want to get up. But as if, you, if you determine to make your choice the night before, then when the adversity, getting up in the morning strikes, that alarm clock goes off, then you're, you're willing to stay the course and, and follow through on that decision. So we need to determine ahead of time that we need to decide in advance what we will do when we're faced with adversity. And here's the second step in the process to be defeat, and that is we need to go the way. First, we know the way. Then we go the way. It's one thing to make a decision in advance, but that decision is worthless if we don't follow through with our actions. What good is it to do to make a decision in advance if we don't actually do anything with it? I actually brought with, with me um, my journal. I, I don't journal. I'm not a journal person, but um, I actually heard some, some really good arguments for journaling this year, and so I for Christmas, I received this journal. It's called the five-year journal. I don't like writing a lot. And so this journal, the way it's laid out, is that uh, there's a little line or a little section for each uh, day in, or each year on a certain day. So for instance, I'm looking right now at January 20th, and so I'm filling out the year 2020 and going through each day, just filling out a little section for that day. And then I'll go back through the next year and the next year and the next year, and I can, I can compare where I was at at different times of the year. So I thought that was a neat idea. So I started journaling at the beginning of this year. But I wanted to point out my, the entry on January 20th, uh, I'm sorry, January 21st, I had heard this practice of, because I'm a procrastinator by nature, so this idea of doing it now uh, is, is not really something that I'm good at. And so I'm always good at saying, why do now what you could put off till later? And I heard this idea that if you want to get better at, at like taking action on something right away, then you recite the, this phrase, do it now, 50 times out loud, 50 times in a row before you go to bed. The last thing that you do before you go lay down your head to go to sleep. And then the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you recite that again 50 times. Do it now, do it now, do it now, do it now. And then when it comes to taking action, that phrase comes back to your mind and you, you're more compelled to do it now instead of putting it off till later. Something I, I, I really need in my life. Here's my entry on January 21st. I need to practice the suggested exercise of saying, do it now. 50 times, first thing when I get up and last thing when I go to bed. So I determined I was going to do that the next day. Journal entry on January 23rd. I failed to execute on the do it now exercise that I identified as a next step yesterday that I wrote in all caps, do it now. <laughs> Here we are, April 12th. I still have not once done that exercise. I put that off. So I, what I'm telling you is that's not how you know the way and then go the way. To go the way, you actually have to follow through with action. You can't just decide to do something. You actually have to go through with actually doing it. I want to, to share with you the words of Jesus and how he was determined to not only know the way and go the way, and one of his disciples, John, records these words of Jesus. He says, I brought glory to you here on earth 
by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. So here's Jesus. He's, he's praying. This is the night before he was crucified. And he's praying, God, help me move through and do what I was called to do. Later on, that same night, in the Garden of Gethsemane, while he's praying, before he was betrayed, before he was, he was arrested, Matthew, his, another one of his disciples, records this, these words. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Wow. So you can, you can hear that he actually was, he was wanting to avoid this. He really didn't want to do this. He wasn't like a glutton for punishment or pain. In fact, the, they record in the New Testament that, that he sweat great drops of blood. I've actually heard that, scientifically speaking, when someone's sweating blood out of their pores, it's because they're under so much stress that the capillaries on the surface of their skin are bursting and the blood is coming out through the sweat pores when they sweat. He was under this deep anguish. And he said, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass for me. But then the last phrase just blows my mind. He says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I will go all the way if that's what I need to do. Why did he do that? Why was he even able to do that? Because he determined ahead of time that he was going to know the way. And when it came to the time to make the decision, he was going to go the way. There was a, a time when I was in high school where a bunch of us uh, who were in youth group together at our church went to a, on this hiking trail to this waterfall. And I watched it, it, this waterfall. There was a spot to jump off into the water below. It was, just, it was safe, I think. And uh, people were jumping off this cliff. It was about a 20-foot drop. And I watched as people who were scared of heights would get on the, the, the um, edge of the cliff and all of us friends were cheering them on, come on, jump, jump, you can do it. And they get ready to the edge and they look over and then they kind of, they get scared and they back off. And they get ready to go to the edge and they back off. And I, you know, I finally built up the courage that I was going to do this too, but I, I think I learned from the fact that they were kind of hesitant that I was going to determine that as soon as I got to the edge of that thing, I wasn't going to pause, I was just going to walk right off the edge and not talk myself out of it. So I determined ahead of time that was what I was going to do. And as I got up to that ledge, I just didn't even think about it. I walked right off the ledge, freaked out, totally freaked out, jumped off that ledge into the water below. Why well, was I able to do that? Because that's an example of when you follow through on what you determine you're going to do. And that's what I did in that situation. <clears throat> I have two examples that I want to share with you of how I believe we as a church, uh, I am proud of you, have, have really not only known the way to go, but have actually gone the way. In this last week, I, I talked to you about our blood drive, our Red Cross blood drives. There's a, a tremendous shortage of blood drive locations for people to go donate right now. And so our church is, um, is hosting three blood drives in the month of April. We hosted one on April 4th. We hosted one on April 9th. And uh, those two drives already happened. In fact, I think we got some pictures of them. This is uh, people from, from uh, the first blood drive on April 4th. And then I think this next picture here, this is a West Sider. Props to Trevor, who's, who gave blood on... Friday, here's Wade, who's getting ready to give blood. And then I believe we have Randon here, and Randon this caught him right after he gave blood, which, by the way, show off, gave blood, his, his, his all the unit that he was supposed to give in four minutes. Blow, blew my mind, but, but uh, we had uh, both blood drives were completely full. We had more people show up. We had walk-ins show up and gave blood. And, and uh, in both drives, we gave way over the goal of blood that needed to be collected. We have well over 100 people whose lives are going to be affected in a positive way because people gave blood. We have another blood drive that's coming up on April 24th, but as of Thursday on uh, April, was it? that's April 5th, not April 9th, on Thursday, April 9th, that blood drive is also full. We are talking to the Red Cross blood drive about possibly having a couple blood drives in May as well, so stay tuned if you'd like to be a part of that. But I just want to say kudos to you guys who not only knew the way to go, but went through with it and actually gave, even though sometimes giving blood can be a scary experience. Other thing we, we talked about last Sunday is that on behalf of, of uh, the Tansborn campus, I uh, told our school partner, Quitom Elementary School, yes, when they asked me, could we help them um, uh, collect snacks that could be delivered with the food to the, the kids who don't have food that, that rely on school meals? They're delivering them through the bus system on the bus routes, and, and uh, they needed some snacks to supplement that because they didn't have the funding to be able to provide snacks for the kids. And I said yes on our behalf, and, I, and after I said yes, I said um, so how many meals a day are uh, we needing to uh, bring snacks for? And he said, oh, it's about 250 a day. And I was like, okay. 
That's a large goal. And I, I mentioned last week in our services, if you were tuning in, you remember this. I said, well, I don't know how many snacks we're going to be able to collect, but you know, if we can get a day, that's 250 snacks. If we could get a week, God willing, that'd be 1,250. That's a lot of snacks. It's a big hill to overcome. I don't know if we can accomplish that. And so we set out to collect snacks. And I, I got to tell you, we, didn't, we, did, we were not able to get to 1,250. In fact, uh, we blew 1,250 out of the water. We had 2,545 snacks turned in the first day that we did this drive. And when the, the, the dust settled, when, when everything was clear, and we got all the snacks that came in, we have a total of 4,961 snacks that you guys collected and dropped off this last week at Westside. I think we have a picture of them here. <laughs> this is all the snacks piled on the table, which, by the way, that table is about to break under the weight of all those snacks. I just want to say to all you guys, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of your willingness to be generous and, and to not only say, I know what we should do, but actually go through with it and actually make action happen. Now, 4,961, I did the math. 5,000 snacks would be an entire month of snacks for those kids. So if any of you didn't get a chance to get in on this or would like to, we're leaving the collection box outside of our campus this week and you can drop some snacks off this week, and we will bring them in each day and collect those and also deliver those to school as well. But I think, I think it'd be exciting to be able to go to the school and say, we have one month full of snacks for your kids. Every day they'll get a snack for an entire month as a result of your guys' generosity. So that is awesome. So the first thing we do is we need to know the way, which we determine in advance the right course of action. The second thing, we go the way. When we meet with adversity, we follow through on what we decided to do in the first place. The third step in the process to beat defeat is this, we show the way. First, know the way, then go the way, and then finally, we show the way. Look at how Jesus showed the way in, in uh, the notes and also on your screen. John records this, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow, do as I have done to you. What's Jesus doing? Jesus, this is the night that Jesus was betrayed, and he was actually with, in company with the person who was going to betray him as well as the other 11 disciples. And he does the act of a servant, and he washes his disciples' feet to demonstrate for them that even though he's the leader, even though he had every reason for them to be washing his feet, to have the tables turned, he said, no, I want to show you how to do it, how a better way that if you're humble, if you serve and you lead out of your, your servant's heart, that's the best way to go. So he showed that with his actions. But he also showed it with his words, one of the, the last things he said to his disciples before he went to heaven, recorded by the author Matthew in the book of Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." See, Jesus not only gave them actions, but he also gave them words to give them direction. And in the words, by the way, that I just read, Jesus also lived that out. All the things he told his disciples to do, that was his mission while he was on earth. And all the things he was telling them to do was stuff he had already demonstrated how to do. Our words and our actions go hand in hand. You see, I believe knowing the way gives us the resolve to do what's right. Going the way gives us the results. But showing the way strengthens our character and prepares us for future adversity. How does that happen? If you've ever uh, raised a child or you've ever taught a class or you've helped someone come along behind you in something you've done before, you know that in teaching somebody, the process of actually sharing with them and showing them what, you, what you've learned and how to do it actually solidifies in you that practice and that habit. It helps grow and strengthen your character and it pre prepares you for the next set of adversity that you're going to face. And I also believe the added bonus, it add, adds values to others. It adds value rather to others. It brings others significance. And I think the, the words of Paul says it best. Paul in, in the book of Philippians to the, the church in Philippi says, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. What's Paul saying? He's saying, watch me. Watch those around us that, are, that know what we're supposed to be doing and follow our example. And I, I, I tell you right now, the most important words that you can say if you want to influence other people is this, follow me. And I want to say those words to you right now. As best as I know how, I want to do the best job I can to demonstrate a life worth following. 
and be able to say to you, follow me as I follow Jesus. And those are actually very humbling words to speak to you because I, I got to be honest with you, I mess up as much as everybody else. If you get close enough to me, you are going to see the warts. You will see the cracks. But I think it's important for us that if we're going to, to lead the way for other people to follow, if we're going to help bring up other people and give them a life of significance and help them to at least go on the journey that we've been able to go on to, whoa, that was a loud sound. Um, I, I, uh, I want to encourage you that you need to go the way you need to also show the way to other people. And you need to be re- willing and ready to say to people who are following behind you, follow me as I follow Jesus. It's an intimidating thing, but I think it's super important. So number one, we know the way. We determine in advance the right course of action. Number two, we go the way. When met with adversity, we follow through on what we've decided. And number three, we show the way. We pour ourselves into those around us. It strengthens our resolve for future adversity and allows us to make a difference. What's the result if we do this? I believe in the words of Paul as he writes to the church in in the ancient town of Galatia. He says this, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. If we stick with it, we don't give up, and we continue through and doing what we know is good, the harvest will come. We will see what God has, has in store for us. When people of good character face problems, they rise to the occasion and are often defined by their response. Bury a person in the snows of Valley Forge and you have a George Washington. Raise him in abject poverty and you have an Abraham Lincoln. Strike him down with paralysis and you become a Franklin D. Roosevelt. Burn him so severely that the doctors say he will never walk again and you have a Glenn Cunningham who set the world record for running the mile in 1934. Oppress them in a society filled with racial discrimination and they become a Booker T. Washington, a Marian Anderson, or a George Washington Carver, or a Martin Luther King Jr. Call him retarded and write him off as uneducable, and you have an Albert Einstein. Cut him from his high school basketball team and you have a Michael Jordan. Handicap her with deafness and blindness and you have a Helen Keller. Afflict him with homelessness at age 15 and you have a Jim Carrey. Serve her arm, uh, sever her arm in a shark, shark attack at age 13 and you have a Bethany Hamilton who went on to win the national championship in surfing two years later. Sexually abuse her as a teenager and you have an Oprah Winfrey. Reject him in film school twice, the film school of his choice twice, and you have a Steven Spielberg. The list could go on and on. The future is up to us. And how will your story unfold? Adversity doesn't have to make us, but it does reveal who we are. When we squeeze an orange, we get orange juice. When you get squeezed by the pressures of adversity, what do you get? If you don't like what you see, determine to change that. Because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting different results. If you want your life to change, you have to be intentional about it. Take some time to reset. Resolve to know the way before you're faced with adversity. Resolve to go the way you predecided in advance. And don't forget to show the way to others to strengthen your character and build others up. You know, as we wrap up today, I want to come back to this the greatest story ever told. The greatest story of love. The story of of a God in heaven who loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to be born in a manger, and 30-something years later, while he had his ministry on earth, lived this perfect, sinless life, he would be arrested, he would be crucified on a cross for your sins and for my sins. Jesus was perfect in every way. He was the perfect sacrifice for us. Jesus came for the people that religion rejected. He came for people who were broken. He came for people who mess up came for people like me, and he came for people like you. And right now, if you're someone who's never made a decision to follow Jesus, and you've heard the story of Easter, maybe you've heard it many times before, but something today catches your attention. And you think to yourself, man, I want a God who loves me like that, a God who would send his son to die on a cross to pay the penalty for my mess-ups. If that's you this morning, I just want to invite you to, to make a decision to follow Jesus with your life. I promise you it'll be the best decision you ever make. It was the best decision I ever made when I made that choice. 
God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His love is bigger than anything. Nothing you can do can separate you from his love. And if you choose him, I promise you that your life will change. It won't change overnight. It'll change moment by moment, day by day, problem by problem, adversity by adversity. But your life will change, and it'll grow stronger. And you'll find that, that the God of the universe who loves you has a life waiting for you that you never could possibly imagine. See, he gives us forgiveness from our past. He gives us a purpose to live for in our, in our present. And he gives us a hope to spend eternity with him in our future. Not only does he give us that, but he also gives us a defined life that we can live out in our life today. God loves you. Can I invite you to accept him today? If you want to do that, I'm going to say a prayer here in a moment. And as I say that prayer out loud, I invite you silently in your own heart to say this prayer along with me as a way to say, God, I don't have all the answers, but today, as best as I know how, I'm handing my life over to you. I want you to be my forgiver and my leader. I want you from this day forward to call the shots in my life. If that's you, say this prayer along with me. It goes like this. Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, save me and make me new. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and serve you the rest of my life. Use me to shine your light, to show your love, and to spread your hope. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I, I want to invite you in the chat window to click the button that says, I commit my life to Jesus. Just let it be known, and by the way, it's anonymous, but let it be known that you made that decision today so we can celebrate with you. So that you, I want to first off say congratulations for your new life in Jesus, but we want to celebrate that with you. I also want to just pause and pray for everyone else here today, and would you, would you pray with me? God, I pray that you will give everyone today a who's tuning in a new perspective on how to handle adversity. Help us to see the adversity that we face as opportunities. Help us this week with intention to determine in advance the right course of action before adversity strikes, to resolve to follow through on those choices in the midst of adversity and the willingness to show others who follow us what we've learned along the way. Thank you, God. Amen.